<laughs> this is kind of amazing. So Michael, thank you very much for doing this conversation. We, uh, we are having these conversations about ma machine behavior because we feel and many people feel that it's time for a new field of study to open up in which machine behavior is studied on its own terms, not just by scientists and engineers, but by people who really understand society. And um, in order to make that a hopefully successful experiment in, in uh, studying machine behavior, we feel that um, we need to have a talk to people like you who know a lot about the machines and who've been actually looking at this for a long time. You have, are in the midst of an incredibly successful computer science career, in particular looking at um, computational market mechanisms and distributed decision making, um, way ahead of the curve on all these things that are sort of running our world now. And so I feel that you have incredibly relevant things to contribute to this concept and to talk about today. So um, with that, I would like to open with the idea that um, humans and machines think differently. We're realizing that as a society. I think people in your field have always known that. Yes. <laughs> and it's sort of spreading now. Um, one field that one area that you have focused on is decision making, attempting to anticipate the future. Can you talk a little bit about that, about sort of how you got into that in the beginning and how it's evolved over time? Well, almost any kind of decision making that's worthy of the term is about trying to anticipate what is the effect of the action if I take action A or action B or action C. Uh, and so that's all about anticipating the future. Uh, it's particularly challenging when part of the future is also determine what other agents are doing. Right. And it, whether the other agents are humans or machines, we also are going to need models of how they're going to be making their decisions to anticipate that as well. Right. And you may need different models depending on whether they're people or machines and what kind of machines they are. Right. So you've experimented with different models beginning in the very early days with uh, you were just kind of opening up this field as a pioneer rate lately. Where has it arrived now? Sort of where does it stand in terms of understanding that kind of decision making? Is there a way to sum that up simply? I know it's a very complicated question. I don't have a very simple yeah. uh, you know, a single you know, glib characterization, uh, but I think it's, it's become an accepted paradigm for mm -hmm. decision making that you formulate a problem of, of mapping out the uncertainty and if you, if you want to uh, define a rational decision-making system um, and consider what are the different costs and benefits of, of actions one can take. Uh, there is increasing use of tools from social sciences, game theory, mm -hmm. in trying to characterize other agent behavior. But I wouldn't say there's overall, overall consensus about what the right model is. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I don't think we've filled up all the toolboxes with the right kinds of models. And I think that's why the machine behavior program is really needed, uh, not just to bring in non-scientists and engineers, but also to help enhance the toolbox of the scientists and engineers right. uh, for when they are trying to analyze these systems. Right, so it flows in both directions. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So one of the great areas of success so far, I as I understand it, is algorithmic trading, which you really were very ahead of the curve on seeing that coming and doing experiments with it. Um, it's something that the public is aware of because we now hear about it with the stock market all the time. One of my favorite tweets of recent times is a New York Times business reporter tweeting a photo of a bunch of computers when there had been a market downturn on Wall Street. And the tweet was, sad photo of Wall Street traders reacting as stock market plunges. <laughs> and it was machines. Right. So it's also become a source of humor. But beneath that kind of observation, there is concern obviously about, wait a minute, are machines doing all the decision making and could this take us to a bad place? Is that justified? I think concern is certainly justified whenever there's a change that's happening faster than you understand. There's certain ways that the automation of trading has led to great efficiencies and potentially better working markets, but also we're going into uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. uh, when you, you, you still see the stock photo of, of, of uh, markets and trading involving these guys shouting at a pit. Right. They're all gone. This is one area where AI has really displaced people uh, for sure. So those stock photos aren't accurate anymore? That stuff just is just for TV. Okay. Uh, the, uh, oh. the actual trading floors are just mock you know, studios. Mm -hmm. uh, no, nothing actually happens on them. Uh, 
those guys have gone off into other pursuits, uh, no doubt. And um, a lot of the trading is really done by algorithms. And I think that uh, you could call it a success. It's certainly a place where automation and autonomous decision making has taken hold. And I think in, it, in retrospect, it might be a bit surprising. You, you might not have thought that the first place where people would trust computers to make decisions are to make high stakes buy and sell decisions you know, right. using their own money. But if you try to understand why that is, well, they worked. Mm -hmm. And um, if you could find a way to uh, harness computation to make a lot of money, it will get adopted. And isn't there a long tradition in human history of um, innovations often beginning in sort of market oriented sort of places where money was being made and there was kind of an advantage to be gotten. I mean, the alphabet was born from traders in the Middle East using symbols to keep track of their losses and profits. Sure. Yeah. I mean, commerce is a very strong motivating force yeah. for innovation. So in a way that explains it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, the fact that uh, the autonomous agents have gone into finance is, I think, very interesting. It, it gives us a uh, kind of a test case for maybe other kinds of autonomy that we're going to care about right. um, in the future. Uh, and you know, there's some reasons I think where maybe it was first, and it's decided if that's where the money is. Markets are, in some respects, a lot simpler than other environments, mm -hmm. right? They, you don't need arbitrary conversation. You're just talking simple languages of, of offerings to buy and sell things Numbers, and negotiations. Yeah. Um, it helps to, you have a lot of data that is where the computers have such advantage over, over people. Uh, no person can respond to information anywhere near as fast as right. uh, the computers can or assimilate lots of many different sources of information coming at them very fast like the computers can. And that's why they've taken that hold. So what is your main concern about where this could go? Like if you have a, a list of worries about where this could head, the, the sort of trading, um, autonomous agents trading in these high stakes parts of our society, what would it be? So I, I would say I'd, I'd break our interest in understanding the effects of autonomous agents in, in two parts. One is just how it affects the efficiency of markets. So they mm -hmm. work better or worse. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, even if it's, there's not going to be any crisis, uh, there's so, so much uh, money at stake, so many so resources at stake, that even small differences in efficiency of markets can make a big difference. Right. But of course, the thing that we probably really care about are is the stability of the financial system affected by these autonomous uh, agents. And uh, it, it may be that they'll even help stability, right? They're, they're reacting to information faster. The very speed, though, by which they react is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really know what can happen. So they, the, the fact that humans are so slow maybe is a... Uh, a check on how, yeah. how fast things can spin out of control. Whereas with autonomous agents, maybe we, uh, uh, things can get out of hand before we can catch them. Uh, also, when you factor in that a lot of these algorithms are based on machine learning, and so we're not in entirely able to anticipate what they're gonna do in every situation. Right, the black box. They're, they're black boxes yeah. and, they're, and they are potentially all using the same data mm -hmm. and we could get into uh, kind of singularity situations where uh, they all jump left when mm -hmm. you, we should have a distribution. Uh, that could, that, those could cause stability problems that we don't really understand. So, and, and moreover, it's all very secret. Mm -hmm. So we have some ideas about the techniques and the methods that the different firms are using, but they don't publicize it. Right. And uh, that means that we're not always sure uh, what, we're, what we're analyzing. We're actually forced into a black box kind of analysis because we have to observe their behavior without being able to even see their code or, or see how they work uh, in principle. Would you say that, so I think the average woman or man on the street, the thing they may wonder about this very question is, have we gotten to a better place since 2007, since the beginning of the, the Great Recession? that was caused by a market crash, or do we not know? I think fundamentally we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, you know, we're, we've been talking about algorithmic trading in financial markets. The, if we're really concerned about the stability of the financial system, it goes beyond just what happens in that trading, but lots of other ways that AI could impact the financial system. Because mm -hmm. increasingly, AI is also making decisions about uh, credit and lending uh, mm -hmm. for consumer credit, for mm -hmm. small business credit, 
maybe even investment kind of uh, bank level decisions will be subject to at least facilitation by by automation. Mm. Uh, and so how will that affect the, the stability of the financial system? All right. So um, not just day to day, but sort of macro effects. That's right. Yeah. OK, thank you. So to kind of transition from trading agents in, in markets to a whole other sort of frontier in your field, um, there's the rising conversation and interest, I think, in um, something uh, people are calling autonomous moralistic agents, which would be wandering around the virtual world sort of enforcing morality of various kinds. Um, I heard an example of someone suggesting that there could be an autonomous moralistic agent that would monitor academic conferences looking for panels that weren't diverse enough and sort of calling out people who were not quite adhering to the rules. What do you think of this whole idea? What are your thoughts? Well, let, let me put it right on the table. <laughs> I'm, I'm in favor of morality. Mm -hmm. But once we talk about agents who are being moralistic, a little less sure, uh, of course, the big problem is who gets to decide what is the moral behavior mm -hmm. that we care about. Right. At, at least in, in a, in a near-term wave of effort, you're talking about somebody is programming this based on their own conceptions. Right. And I think it's problematic to decide your part that, oh, yes, this is enforcing a code without at least full disclosure mm -hmm. about which, uh, what codes are being enforced and on, on, on what basis uh, that's the case. Right. And very hard to... Imagine setting up um, sort of governance of this. I mean, governments already having a hard, of time, hard enough time with AI affecting mechanical things, relatively mechanical things like markets and elections. But now you talk about morality, where legislating morality has always been the most difficult area of debate and decision making. Yeah, to be honest, I think we're often better off if we try to uh, take those value judgment labels off the table right. and really talk more directly about what it is. What is the behavior or um, activity that we are either trying to encourage or prohibit mm -hmm. and make sure that we are clear about doing that? I mean, uh, it, it sounds like some of these bots are in implementing kinds of censorship and censorship is is necessary, you know, mm -hmm. Facebook censors this, your, your feed in just making decisions about what to include and, and what not. And the more transparency we can have on what the criteria are for that, I think the better for all of us. So we actually know what's happening. Right. Although there will always be sort of bad actors who will try and work around that and subvert whatever we're attempting to do, right? And moreover, right, so there's limits to transparency because the more transparent you are, of course, the uh, easier it is for these bad actors to find loopholes. Mm -hmm. So you have to walk a line between um, being above board on what you're trying to accomplish and maybe something about the features, but maybe not giving your whole algorithm because then it can be defeated. Right. And we have these kinds of arms races, you know, in spam <laughs> right. uh, and you know all over the place. That you know it's quite it's quite common and they're it, they're always evolving. Okay. Uh, so one of the concepts that you have explored in depth is something that I find might be the most inaccessible to a layperson, which is why I want to ask about it, um, which is um, this idea of cascades and the role played by um, strategic cascades and sort of how this emerging AI-driven society that we're building might work. Can you talk about sort of what that phrase means even? Sure. So you're referring to some work we did looking at uh, under what conditions someone who wants to influence, say, the adoption of a product or the transmission of an idea could set up the system to make it go in their favor. Right. Uh, and the lesson of that work that we did was that it really matters a lot what you assume about the agents that were in that system. Mm -hmm. Are they um, simple, myopic responders? Do they just do what you know, locally seems to be the right thing? Or are they far ahead looking strategic agents that are right. uh, considering what, anticipating what each other are going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that depending on which extreme you assume, you can get arbitrarily different behavior. Mm -hmm. You can have situations where when the agents are strategic, they're very easy to influence, but if they're myopic, you cannot influence them or vice versa. Mm. Uh, and I think that you know, methodologically bears on the question of you know, what is the right kind of assumption to make. We argue that uh, there's no 
value-free assumption or cost-free assumption. There's no minimal assumption. If you assume agents are too smart, you could go wrong. But if you assume they're too dumb, you could also mm -hmm. go wrong. Think about how to influence agents. Uh, if an agent, if the agents you want to influence are very smart and forward-looking, what you do is you incentivize them. You try to reward them to, mm -hmm. to help get the behavior you want. If you think the agents are not rational, then instead you try to trick them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's these two different approaches you take based on the assumptions you're making over parties. To the, to the extent that anyone is not perfectly rational, there's some trick you could find to get them to do the wrong right, thing. Right. I would argue that we are better off if our networks are healthy enough that we mostly try to persuade and influence through incentives and, and you know, rational persuasion as opposed to deception and, and trickery. And those who are trying to influence, say, social networks, uh, have often found benefit from the deception and trickery. Uh, how can we get more rationality into those systems so that you can't get a, an easy cascade through the trickery? Right. So uh, you've, the terms you're using, myopic and strategic, for example, for these cascades and for the agents, suggests that this is one way in which AI is mirror, really mirroring people. I mean, we all know people who are rather myopic in their... <laughs> vision, and this, this, I don't mean literally their vision, but the way they think about things, and people who are strategic and sort of rational. Is that, in fact, happening with, as AI evolves? I think so. I mean, in fact, even people are perhaps strategic in some domains, and myopic in, in others, sure. and how yeah. they react. We're all limited. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that certainly at that level, uh, the AIs will also have that spectrum. Mm -hmm. of, of their behavior, how, how it should be characterized in different situations. And then the response would have to take that into account. Right. Right. Um, so you, you are part of an um, exciting new research effort at Michigan, $6.25 million grant um, to study networks and to get a deeper understanding of how networks work to really address a lot of these challenges that we've been talking about. Can you tell me more about that and sort of the significance and potential of that project? Yes, that's a very new project that we're very excited about that's in collaboration with three other universities. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we intend to be studying there is strategic reasoning on networks at multiple scales. That is decision-making of agents that can be at different levels of aggregation. So maybe in one setting we'll reason about individuals, but in another setting maybe firms mm -hmm. or households or other groups that these agents represent. Mm -hmm. And how to fluidly move from thinking about them at coarse grain scales to fine grain scales in the same model. Mm. So could this help us go after some of the problems we're talking about today? For example, what's happened in the news environment where it's this chaos. There seem to be some bad actors and bad tendencies and not all of us feel we're getting good information every day. Could this kind of research on networks sort of get deeper into that and help us find solutions possibly? Uh, we hope so. We, you know, part of it is to also understand um, influence on networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those purposes, it sometimes may be beneficial to be thinking at the micro scale about the individual propagation of the network. Other times it might be helpful to think about big actors like media companies or uh, Russian bots <laughs> or mm -hmm. your collections of them or whatever your, the group of, of interest is. Uh, you won't be surprised that my, some of my particular interest is in financial networks and trying to understand how uh, financial crises might propagate uh, by having different kinds of granularity of analysis. It could mm -hmm. be from the fine grain individual transactions to much coarser level aggregate debt holdings of, of major uh, mm -hmm. financial firms. And is this something that you're going to, so does the research involve collaborating with sort of organizations outside academia, or is it all inside sort of testing and experiments? So, so this is a, a, a basic research project, so it's mostly um, based on the different universities, USC, UCLA. Right, and more theoretical uh, at the moment. Uh, Michigan, and more theoretical at the yeah. moment. But all of us, or, or most of us in the project, have some ties to some applications mm -hmm. that we're going to be bringing in. Great, great. Well, it's, that's exciting. Congratulations. So another uh, frontier of your work, I gather, uh, an interest of yours is cyber defense. And that is something that has actually filtered down to the everyday conversation and people concerned about it and feeling like it's an area that perhaps our elected representatives don't have enough of a handle on as they should. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, I gather you're interested in adaptive systems that would actually take our cyber defenses to a new level of security, hopefully. 
Sure. I, I guess it's a, it's kind of a sad story that almost any computer scientist these days has to be concerned about security. Right. Every individual right. uh, does. Uh, we our systems are so vulnerable, and uh, we have to spend so much of our trying to trying to protect them. The the idea of adaptive cyber defense is certainly something that we did not invent, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're we're helping to try to study it. Uh, is to uh, reconfigure your own computational situation in order to stay ahead of, of an attacker, mm -hmm. of, of an adversary. So for example, uh, an attacker may be probing your network or your computer system over time to try to figure out things about it and ultimately find the vulnerability that will let them take it over. But if you periodically or with some randomness will just reconfigure some things, you set them back to square one. Mm. They, they, they probe, they've learned some stuff, but then you change. And so mm -hmm. everything they've learned is um, is moot and they have to relearn it. Right. That's a way to, it's sometimes called moving target defense, mm. where you uh, reconfigure yourself to try to uh, defeat any kind of progressive attack. So in the, in the popular mind, um Thinking about this problem, obviously one of the great case studies is our election a couple of years ago, and these um, apparent intrusions that were not out of the blue. As you know, I'm sure the Russians had been doing things like this in Ukraine, for example, one of their main test beds for these, this kind of work for a long time. Um, is there a way in which we're still playing catch up, or is there a kind of a because of events like this, there's new urgency, new funding. Is this an expanding field where we can hope that there's going to be real serious advances in, in the near future? So I think there's a lot of advances, but it's it's an arms race, like all these other things, right? right? And um, you can only temporarily uh, try to stay ahead of the adversaries, um, and maybe only in certain ways. And you know, the best defenses are depending on what you understand about the different um, attacks. Mm -hmm. And we try to you know introduce new principles to help. Uh, accelerate how much progress we could make um, on the defense side. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe ironically, or one of the difficulties is that often these same techniques can also get used by attackers. Right. And, uh, but are these prominent examples that we know about in particular, like the election, are they helpful to researchers to be able to study sort of what happened and look back and at least see an example of a failure? They are, although I have to say it's not too hard to find examples of right, like every day, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, you know, and we've been talking about the financial system. Financial service companies are under attack twenty four seven and have been for many years. And so there's and and you know, as our defense node, you know, the uh, military nodes, it's it's uh, very easy to find experience of attacks and and failures to respond to attacks to use to learn from. Right. Interesting. So my. Um I'm a humanities person working at MIT at the Media Lab, um, and I try to bring a, my interest is in sort of technology and the cause of humanism, basically. And I feel that a lot of the work you're doing is really directly related to that and to uh, really making the, the AI-driven world that we're building a more human dwelling place, if you will. Um, is there reason for optimism? You know, all we see is bad news lately about this. Is, are there reasons in which we could think not only we're going to stop these problems you and I have been talking about, but that actually we might make unforeseen progress with these very same tools? Well, I think there is a community that is working on it. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is the grounds uh, for optimism. I think these are very hard problems. Right. And uh, society doesn't always have a great track record of being able to in Anticipate speculative problems and head them off, you know, before they get really hard. Right. Um, so I think all we can do is do our best to try to get good ideas on the table to preserve uh, the right humanity to coexist with uh, with AI as it develops. Uh, so I don't have to necessarily characterize as optimistic or, or pessimistic overall, uh, but we're certainly this is the time, this is the moment that that we need to be working on trying to ensure the better future. And do you find that your students at Michigan um, themselves are optimistic about and, and sort of um, excited to be part of that effort and to kind of take it to the next level of, again, not just playing defense, but really progress and building for the future? I think so. I think that um, technologists mm -hmm. are kind of naturally uh, interested in progress and change and get excited uh, mm -hmm. about that. And part of it is the challenge of, of, of new situations. Um, but yes, they're also drawn by trying to uh, 
make the world a better place and 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 bend the arc of technology towards the more beneficial ways that it can develop. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and sort of on a somewhat contrary note to what I just said, I know you've had some recent comments about superintelligence and these scenarios we're seeing about where that could take us and that we have to be strategic thinking about that and we shouldn't be trapped by sort of current day knowledge and experience. Can you talk a little bit about that and sort of your prescription for how we should think about superintelligence? Yes, I think the, uh, the artificial intelligence world is trying to figure out how to grapple with uh, thinking about the potential futures and the risks of, of artificial intelligence and also how to communicate it um, right. to the public. And I think we often get confused because there are different timescales of risks and threats. So the things we're talking about algorithmic trading and so on, these are near-term, actually today's potential right. you know, risks and, and things have to do with autonomous driving, you know, uh, autonomous weapons, other kinds of things like that. Superintelligence is the prospect of machines that can do anything better than people. And we're, it's, we seem to be quite far from that right now. Uh, but that's also a, a threat to, to humanity that we should be thinking about even now. Um, and I think it's okay. I think we can actually work on multiple timescales. We can think about the... Uh, so, sorry, so you're not one of these who just thinks it's doomsaying. It's really legitimate to pay attention to. I, I, not only legitimate, but I think it, it is essential. Okay. Uh, to, because I, I said it seems to be far in the future, mm -hmm. but we could get surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the possibilities of the future of artificial intelligence is that things really progress very rapidly at some right. point. That's sometimes called the intelligence explosion. Mm -hmm. And that's very controversial. It's not clear that it will happen or it won't happen. We don't really know enough to rule it in or out. But even the fact that it's possible means that it would be important for us to have techniques and ideas on the table or on the shelf mm -hmm. that we can pull down uh, you know, when we need them. Mm. Um, and I think that we can work we can be thinking about the far future and developing ideas that will be beneficial to that. At the same time, we deal with the uh, nearer term issues with controlling AI. And it's also quite possible that the lessons we learn from our near term efforts will turn out to be useful for addressing the, the far off. Or problems. at least upgrading them as we move forward. Yes. Yeah. Um, and th is this something that um, you you feel what do you think about the kind of the I mean we live in a world of dystopian movies and it seems to be what everybody's talking about Westworld and sort of all these stories do you think that those are creating a level of fear that is overblown or is there some justification or, or is there good news in that in that at least people are thinking about it yes I, I so I, I think it is good to think about it now the, the problem is that as a society we sometimes just seem to only be able to exist in these two states of total complacency, everything's going to be great, mm -hmm. or total panic, we're all going to die. Right. And unfortunately, we, we, that's, neither of those is very constructive. Right. We want to be in this middle ground where we have reasoned concern about existential threats or potential you know, issues we should be dealing with, at the same time, living our lives and you know, believing things are okay. Mm -hmm. I like to believe that we're capable as a society to grapple to, you know, uh, without just being at those extremes all the time. Um, it's true that when there is so much attention to the extreme dystopia, people just go right into that mode and, and, and it gets them hard to have sensible conversations. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't, uh, you know, try, I wouldn't try to rule those out or say that they're totally out of hand. So when you're um, just having sort of walking down the street, thinking about the future and so forth, personally thinking about where all this could be heading, say, two or three generations forward. Do you lean positive? So the, maybe this is a personal <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, my, my brain has a hard time um, coming to the total positive, uh -huh. optimistic. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. Okay. Uh, uh, because I just said, because I think there's, there's quite a challenge, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I think that uh, humanity has not had uh, a great track record of being able to deal with extreme sudden changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that, that's the kind of thing I, I worry about. Because I think that, that that some of those are really inevitable. I would like us to get started, you know, early on mm -hmm. to try to uh, adapt ourselves. I've been, I've been reading a lot about this obvious 
analog to this era, which is the, the printing press period and the Reformation and sort of everything that came out of the printing press. And one of the things I've learned in reading about that period is that the printing press was invented in the 1450s, but over 150 years later in Shakespeare's lifetime, people were still struggling and there was still an amazing amount of dislocation and disruption and all kinds of social upheaval related to this same machine. So it takes a while. It can take a really long time for a truly revolutionary technology to kind of settle out. And is, could that be happening today? Are we seeing an echo of that? It could be. And things may move, the technical part may move faster, but the societal reaction may still take quite a long time. Right. If you think about artificial intelligence, having smart machines, how could that not be disruptive right. to labor markets, to the s production and services that we, that we enjoy, politics. the way we do things, politics, yeah. almost any other realm of, of human life. Okay. So is there a way in which um, an AI superpower could emerge or a series of superpowers who have some kind of a monopoly or duopoly over AI and actually suck up all the power in the world and sort of dominate? So it's at least possible that a significant advance in artificial intelligence could have a kind of winner takes all mm. uh, dynamic where uh, they're better at everything and can totally marginalize the, pr the productive value of, of everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and that itself, the prospect of that leads to a potential arms race in AI technology and has other counterproductive features like it could encourage great secrecy about the development of AI, which mm -hmm. could, could uh, make it hard to protect against mm -hmm. the, the bad consequences uh, of it as well. So I think that is at least one uh, Im imperative for trying to support as much open AI research, mm -hmm. uh, not proprietary, not just government um, sponsored and, and, and focused, so that we can try to avoid this dynamic of a winner take all situation. Isn't there a way in which some other countries already view us as that emerging power? I mean, you look at the Europeans' efforts to regulate what Silicon Valley is doing, basically. I mean, that would seem to be the, a leading fear of everybody outside the United States, right? I think there's a lot of different uh, power Scenarios. sectors that have yeah. that that have that fear about each other. Right. So that I think is very it's very easy for that to emerge as even more prominent. Mm -hmm. And is this something that is this an area? I know this is not something you're focused on, but are are there people sort of doing research on this and developing possible blocks to something like that happening? So I think that. As far as AI goes, that's this is in, in, in the more speculative no. realm of long-term concern about superintelligence, but it plays out in some specific areas um, right away. For example, cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. We were talking about cybersecurity as a uh, you know particular area of development, but it's also an area where, of course, AI is going to be uh, especially important and, and prominent. The, right. the the cyber warfare of the future and even of the of the present day is to a large part conducted by autonomous agents mm -hmm. uh, that are probing defenses and 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 and, and beefing up defenses uh, all the time. And so uh, this is an area where having an, an edge or an advance is again, you know, leads to tremendous leverage and potential even you know, military advantages. Mm -hmm. well, one thing we haven't talked about that could play into this domination of a certain power or not necessarily political power, but group of people is AI's ability to literally influence people's thinking and emotions and to trigger vulnerabilities and sort of play to those aspects of our lives that previously have been almost inaccessible. Are there ways in which that research needs to be expanding and paid closer attention to, or is that already happening? I know people are concerned about it more and more. Yes, I, I think uh, certainly whether the, the goal is explicitly to manipulate uh, people, but of course, uh, the goal of advertising is mm -hmm. to <laughs> influence, and you could use the word manipulation if you want, mm -hmm. uh, tastes and choices. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of temptation mm -hmm. to exploit any new ability to do that effectively mm -hmm. that's leveraged by AI. So I think it uh, is important, and I would advocate for 
having clear rules about disclosure of when you're talking to a bot versus talking to a human, right? Because that might at least put up, put you on guard mm -hmm. more, or at least allow people to opt out or 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 put up, you know, defenses, defenses uh, yeah. the, uh, when they need to. Do you think that the ability to manipulate people is inevitably going to ramp up because we're only at the beginning of this? Or will there be a kind of a plateau? Uh, I think people are ultimately pretty manipulable if you know <laughs> yeah. enough about them. Yeah. And so, yes, that's a, that's a real concern. So we could, we, who knows where we're heading? Right. So I think yeah. we, that's why we probably need explicit safeguards. We can't rely on ourselves mm -hmm. to... Uh, not be manipulated. And are these cases that are so well known, Facebook in the election and so forth, are those actually great examples to learn from or are there cases that people like you know about that are even more helpful or more illustrative of where we may be heading? So I, I think those are great examples mm -hmm. and but I, I, another example you, uh, I, again I'll say is in, in finance. Mm -hmm. uh, market manipulation is a thing Right. And uh, you may have heard of spoofing when yes. parties will put in orders that they don't really uh, intend to trade in mm -hmm. order to mislead others about what the state of supply and demand is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that's done all the time now. And AIs can probably do it in more clever and subtle and harder to detect ways. And, uh, uh, and that's I think legal. That, right? And it, well, uh, no. So spoofing is not legal. Oh, okay. um, but but defining exactly where the line is on what's legal and what's not is very mm -hmm. uh, difficult to draw. You know, this, I think this is actually a very interesting issue because uh, the law also moves very slowly mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, is probably not keeping up with the pace of technology um, and AI. And one of the particular concerns that um, I've noticed I, I've observed particularly in the, in the area of market manipulation is that a lot of the law is based on intent. I think I even the way I described it a moment ago was putting in an order that you don't really intend to trade. Right. We kind of know what that means when we talk about a, an order that some person put in, but what about an order that an algorithm put it in? Oh, what did right. the algorithm intend uh, for that? You might be able to tell by looking at its code, but what if it even just learned the strategy from data? In what the black the, box. In the black box, yeah. what did it intend? Yeah. Uh, so to convict this, that software or to convict the author of that software, you're going to have to somehow determine intent of the, the algorithm, mm -hmm. right? Which is probably uncharted legal territory. There's a lot of law that was designed for worlds where people were making all decisions. And now that machines are making the decisions, we either need to expand the definitions or have new laws. Mm -hmm. I think there's a potentially a very large fraud loophole because <laughs> uh, a lot of fraud law is based on intent. Oh. Uh, and that's maybe a killer app for AI um, as well. Uh, the political manipulation that you're referring to is a kind of fraudulent mm -hmm. processing of information. But commercially, it's even more opportunities for, mm -hmm. uh, for using fraud to um, bad ends. Mm -hmm. So again, we're kind of, um, we keep going down into this sort of negative scenarios, but I want to ask for a positive, another positive scenario. Uh, so, uh, well, there's an MIT professor who proposed that perhaps that because humans are in a sense emotional and vulnerable to um, influences and so forth as we've been talking about that um, perhaps a human run US Congress for example is not the best system we could have and maybe we should have AI agents rational AI agents who represent all of us in Congress and sort of are making decisions in a much cleaner um, you know, less human in a way, but more logical fashion. What do you think of ideas like that? So I find that, that the, the notion very appealing and I'd like to you know, believe in it, but I think that um, it's really not just the emotions and the irrationality of the interactions. It's really uh, some of our political stalemate is due to conflicts and values. Mm -hmm. And those don't go away because right. you have the bots, because you still have to decide what values are they going to represent, and you right. have just as much a problem of, of deciding that. You need a political process for deciding that. Right, they're not going to develop their own values as bots. Uh, or uh, we could uh, somehow ask them to do that. Ask them to do that, right. but uh, I, I doubt that there's much trust in any process that would lead yeah, to that. Yeah, that could go to a bad place. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So about 60 years ago, I think it was, the British writer and thinker C.P. Snow 
wrote a famous essay about the two cultures, science and the arts, and how separate they were, and that this was a problem for the future. And his emphasis was on the arts people, on the humanities side, actually not being savvy enough about the science side. And you folks got to jump over that divide and become more scientific, more technological. Arguably, something reverse is happening now. And a lot of people on the humanities side are saying to people on the technology side, you people need to know more of what we know in order to take this revolution to a better place. Um, is there any validity to that point that they're making today, do you think? I think there certainly is. It just is uh, evidenced by the difficulty we have of having conversations across these cultures mm -hmm. uh, very often. And I think that uh, AI people and technologists do themselves a real disservice when they pull rank and assert their priesthoodly rights to you know, tell outsiders that they don't know what they're talking about. And especially when they refuse to address some of these long-term issues and the, and the real risks and potential downsides of technology, I think that they are hurting their credibility mm -hmm. uh, with the outsiders and will, will lose that trust. You know, it's not really just humanities and science. Your society as a whole has seems to have much less trust of science. Do you than, think? But than, on the other hand, it has more power than ever. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, I think um, commercially, you know, it does, and technology really drives a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, scientists and the and debates about environment and climate are often very much discounted, mm -hmm. um, and policy is not necessarily driven uh, to the ideal way that it could be informed by objective scientific right, uh, you right. know, uh, exploration. And I True. think that is you know, a, a part of the, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not saying it's just because people don't know enough science, it really is because we, we've just got too much of that divide. Do you think that, um, do you find among your colleagues that there is any hankering for this now? given everything that we're talking about, the debate, the concern about AI, hankering for the humanities point of view, and like some way in which couldn't we get those people in here more? Or does it feel like the priesthood really doesn't need them? So it varies. I think that, uh, you know, from my own experience, I've got a lot of benefit by reaching out to social scientists, right? Which is not the same thing as, mm -hmm. as humanists, uh, of course. No, but it's a but step it's, but, in but that it's direction. A step, it's a step, you know, in that direction. Certainly a lot of uh, AI has reached out to psychology, and it's like to be informed by that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think there are you know, certain other parts of uh, the technological world that is trying to, uh, to, to reach out um, to bring in ethics, say. There are those skeptics, though, that say, OK, uh, do the philosophers you know, it, it, it have anything practically to tell us mm -hmm. about what we should actually do? They, have very refined ways to talk about these things, but is there any operational yeah. aspect of that? Now, maybe it should be put to the test. Yeah, I mean, there's this quantitative, qualitative dis divide that is just this yawning chasm. It's very hard to imagine how, it, how you bridge it, unless, could AI become more like us in that sense? Like actually get more qualitative aspects of existence, ultimately? How do you code it? So, um, if by qualitative you mean um, ambiguous, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that may be you know, pretty hard. That's hard. To, to know yeah. what, we're, uh, what we're talking about there. You know, if, if you could say, can AI uh, end up exhibiting the kind of aesthetic uh, uh, powers as some people do, I think certainly. Mm, really? Right? Yes, because it, it, you know, at least in the same way that we judge whether the aesthetic product of an artist is good, it's based on what people like. Mm -hmm. uh, AIs can learn how to produce art that people like and find beautiful and uh, uh, and otherwise. But they're how not, else, a, they're not at this judging? level yet. Uh, <laughs> they're not, but uh, there's no reason to think that they couldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't prove that, you know, what it, we don't know what it takes uh, to do that. Right. right. So I'm interested in the trading agent competition work that you've done, which is a very notable and influential piece of your work. It goes back to um, 2001, roughly. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the early days of that and what were some of kind of the key moments that um, sort of leap out at you as important um, anecdotes or stories from how that emerged? So when we first uh, started doing work on strategies of agents who are making trades in markets for e-commerce in particular, uh, we were a little bit of a quandary about how to evaluate the work. Because the when you're trading in a market, how good a strategy is depends on what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. And we could also make up what everyone else was doing, but that seemed like kind of cheating. So what we thought is really what we need to do is engage the community and get other other parties, other researchers from different perspectives to also write their own strategies and use a competition framework to help evaluate the research. Mm -hmm. And that, that turned out to be pretty successful in putting together a community that was competing and uh, sh was able to show year to year how the ideas were progressing and they were cross-fertilizing and building it on, on each other and also using uh, those ideas to test their own work. Uh, one, I think, particularly interesting about it looking back is how it relates to the machine behavior program. Uh, because once we're analyzing these systems of agents that are written by different research groups, uh, we can try to understand that ecosystem without necessarily having access directly to all those other, other agents. So if we were going to participate, we would need to have models of these others. Uh, essentially treating them to some extent like, like back, black boxes. Mm -hmm. We may uh, have some observational evidence about what they're doing and then try to use that to uh, exploit it. I think we had some examples where that really turned up. One of my uh, favorite from the early days of the competition was uh, we tried to see how well economic theories of price equilibrium might be borne out by trading agents in this kind of competition. Now, was this in the travel booking experiment? Uh, so, yes, this was yep. actually in, the, in a scenario that involved travel shopping. Right. And trying to predict what the prices in particular um, of uh, hotel rooms was going to be. Uh, it turned out that uh, using a concept from economics called Valrhasian equilibrium mm -hmm. uh, was actually the best way to predict what the prices would turn out to be even though we knew that none of the agents was literally following the theory in constructing their decisions to buy and sell. But you also didn't markets. know what exactly how they were operating. You were making your own model. We were making our own model. Um, and you know, we knew from some written accounts about what they were and weren't doing. But in any given year, there's new ones coming in that we had never seen before. Mm. Uh, and yet still, the theory tended to fit pretty well what we, uh, and, uh, what we were predicting. And did that extend to then other domains beyond that first, what you were looking at in that first experiment, travel? Uh, uh, yes, we applied it in the supply chain uh, mm -hmm. you know, to some degree as well mm. um, and found that basic approach was also pretty successful. Mm. Great. And were there any stunning flops? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we saw some pretty stunning phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the supply chain competition, uh, one of the most interesting uh, things that happened in the early days was uh, a kind of very uh, negative dynamic of, of uh, ruinous competition. The reason was, the way it was set up, the... the uh, hey, what do you mean by that ruinous competition? Like everyone's getting ruined or...? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in particular because the way it was set up, uh, the agents were PC manufacturers and they had to buy supplies like chips and so on. They had to buy supplies like chips and so on in order to build their computers. Um, and it turned out that unless they bought them right at the beginning, the, at the beginning the prices were as low as they were ever going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so everyone wanted to buy them then. But the problem is if you bought a lot of chips and then it turned out the demand for PCs was very low, you would lose a lot of money. Oh, yeah. But at the beginning you didn't know yet what the demand was going to be. So everyone had to, was, was rushing to get them at the beginning. And then if the demand was low, they, they would have to cut the prices and PCs so much they would all lose a lot of money. Hmm. So uh, what we did was we exploited a loophole in the rules to put in what were preemptive orders, orders that were not going to get filled but would prevent everybody from buying on day zero. Hmm. Um, and it turned out that by doing that, we prevented everybody else from doing what they were trying to do but as a result, everybody's profits went up hmm. because 
Instead, they could delay when they were buying their components till when they knew what demand was going to be and not and avoid that ruinous so competition. So opposite of ruinous. Everybody opposite doing well. Opposite of ruinous. Yeah. Huh. Yes, everyone doing better. So is that kind of research the roots of some of the supply chain success stories of today, the Zara clothing chain and so forth, where people learn to be incredibly fine-grained in how they make these decisions? So I wouldn't claim a connection to that work yeah. you know, that we did in, in, in particular. Right. But I think that those lessons do apply to a lot of the supply chain phenomena that people have observed mm. uh, in more recent times. Right. Great. Do you, do you have a struggle with keeping people in academia when they have all this money to be made and all this potential impact by going to work for companies in Silicon Valley and elsewhere? So right now, in this moment, there's quite a uh, market mismatch between supply and demand mm -hmm. for computer scientists and, and AI, people with knowledge of machine learning and artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. no doubt about that. I think, though, that's mostly because of the pipeline. It takes a, a long time for people to get uh, educated. I think that, the, that demand will stay high. Supply will eventually catch up with it. You know, academia is ultimately a pyramid scheme where uh, every professor is producing more than is needed to replace them. So I, I don't have concerns in the long run. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to populate academia uh, to meet the need. But certainly in the short run, the, the mismatch is causing uh, salaries to skyrocket. And certainly people entering college and graduating from college are getting very strong signals from the job market that they must learn about computer science and, and major in it. And, I think it's a great subject, so, so mm -hmm. to some extent, of course, that's, that's great. But if people are doing it just for the, for the wrong uh, mercenary reasons, that's, uh, that's a bit unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that seems to be financially driven by parental pressure, you know, and sort of study this or don't go at all sort of thing, which is unfortunate. Do you, um, speaking of uh, machine learning um, and the importance of academia, there's now this discussion, I know, inside computer science and somewhat leaking outside computer science that maybe the whole model for deep learning is sort of broken and we need to start over. At least some people have said that, Jeff Hinton in particular. Isn't that a problem if it's true, and you may disagree, and has to be fixed that academia would have to take on rather than it being done somewhere out in the marketplace? Yeah, to be honest, I don't really even know how to... Uh parse what that would mean for the whole thing to be broken. I mean, we're always inventing new techniques and then thinking of better techniques that may supersede the old ones. And so it's evolving. Of it. It, it always evolves no. and sometimes there's more um, discrete jumps or, 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 or switches over and things. Right now, deep learning has enabled all kinds of capabilities that were uh, very far out of reach a few years ago. So mm -hmm. it seems that we've got quite a bit to explore that, no doubt, that the, the capabilities will plateau and we'll reach limits and we'll need to come up with with new ideas. Take a new jump. Yeah. Great. Thank you.